This is a little awkward. How do you introduce somebody who needs no introduction? Um, we all know that His Excellency Dr. Sultan Al Jaber is the incoming president of COP28. We know he's the cabinet minister for industry and advanced technology. We know he's CEO of ADNOC. Um, so I thought, let me get personal and maybe say a few things that uh, may not be on his formal uh, CV. Um, in 2006, that's 16, 17 years ago, he became the founding CEO of Masdar with this outsized ambition to promote renewable energy, not just in UAE, but around the world. And today, Masdar is one of the world's largest financing organizations for renewable energy. Uh, they've done projects in 40 countries, over 20 gigawatts, and the ambition is to do 100 gigawatts of renewable energy projects. In fact, uh, Dr. Sultan, I have this um, strange theory uh, that you've been working for, on renewable energy for so long that you've developed this some um, secret osmosis uh, system by which you imbibe that energy because that's the only way that you can keep going 18 to 20 hours a day, day after day, week after week. There's some secret solar-powered batteries that you run on. Um, but also, let me come to your other hat as CEO of ADNOC. And I think for the members, for our audience here, it's important to know about the work that you've been doing relentlessly towards decarbonization of the fossil fuels industry, towards carbon capture and storage, and particularly for this COP28, I hope what we are going to see is a paradigm shift because what we've seen is an attempt to ostracize the fossil fuels industry and to make it like an untouchable. But they have to be a part of the solution. They have to come on the table and work to produce these solutions that are needed. And that's where I think it's particularly important to have somebody who has this deep understanding about this industry, about what it can do, the financial resources, the technical resources that it can bring to the table. Uh, that, I think, is crucial. And finally, at a personal level, let me just make one last point. He is a true friend. When he makes a commitment, he means it. And the evidence is he's had a relentless travel schedule, and he's moved heaven and earth to be here with us. He's arrived from somewhere um, an hour back. And uh, so Dr. Sultan, we are particularly grateful that you've changed your schedules and you are here with us this morning. Uh, just one last word. Uh, Dr. Sultan has very grateful, uh, graciously uh, agreed that um, after his remarks, he will also take a couple of questions from the audience. Dr. Sultan, yours. Excellencies, delegates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it indeed gives me great pleasure to be here with such esteemed colleagues and esteemed audience. And it is a pleasure to be here for this very special forum from G20 to COP28. Allow me though to begin by thanking all of you for being here and my very dear colleagues his Excellency, the former ambassador to the UAE and the current ambassador for their great work and their persistence in ensuring that we continue on building uh, a very strong trajectory and a pathway for a very strong long-term strategic partnership between the UAE and, and India. Allow me also to acknowledge the leadership of India's T20 for organizing today's important and timely gathering under the theme of energy, climate and growth. This theme, in fact, aligns very much with the UAE's approach to COP28. And as most of you have heard me many times, in the past few months, I kept repeating that the UAE very much values and appreciates the trust that has been given to us in hosting this consequential COP. We approach it with 
sincere humility, a deep sense of responsibility, and a great sense of urgency. This COP is very much focused and entirely dedicated in ensuring that everything we do keeps our main focus on the North Star, and that is keeping 1.5 within reach. While, of course, we work hard in getting the world to accept the realities on the ground. We fully support and embrace an energy transition. But this energy transition must be orderly, must be responsible, must be equitable, must be fair, and must be just. We can't get carried away with emotions or ideologies. And we don't want to leave anyone behind. Our COP, COP28, will frame climate action as a true progressive opportunity for growth. This COP will aim for ambitious and balanced outcomes through the first global stock take. And this, of course, will cut across all climate pillars, mitigation, adaptation, and, of course, means of implementation. Through the G20 presidency, India has clearly demonstrated a unique ability in managing and maneuvering through many dynamics. India has proven its leadership and dedication to climate action that promotes access to energy and ensuring sustainable socio-economic development. Prime Minister Modi has been clearly identified as a true genuine leader. He demonstrated his commitment to multilateralism. He fostered global cooperation and successfully rallied countries around the critical issues that we all face today. Under his leadership and under his guidance, countries representing 85% of the global economy agreed to COP28's global goal of tripling renewable energy capacity and doubling energy efficiency by 2030. And Prime Minister Modi has led by example with his push for 500 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity as part of the energy mix in India by 2030. That clearly shows unique determination and leadership. And that clearly shows that individual countries can aim high when the political will is actually there. The UAE shares his vision for embracing an energy transition in line with sustainable socio-economic development. The UAE have been a pioneer in adopting renewable energy. We are the home to the largest renewable energy assets in the world, and we are the largest renewable energy investor in the world. Facts, figures, and numbers justify that. We continue to view energy diversification as an opportunity. We do not view energy transition or the advancement of renewable energy as a threat. We see it as a true opportunity. We find it to be a logical step and a natural extension for our extended responsible leadership as a reliable supplier of energy to the world. And of course, we continue to view energy diversification and the energy transition as an opportunity to develop both our economy as well as economies 
around the world. The G20 and COP28 both recognize the critical need for a new paradigm when it comes to climate finance. In fact, that is my second pillar of my overall strategy as COP28 president. And we know that we must engage in a very open dialogue to help fix the climate finance, to ensure that finance is made available, accessible, and affordable to the Global South. <clears throat> we must rebuild trust and faith in multilateralism. And that must start by building a bridge between Global North and the Global South. Unmet promises, unmet promises like the 100 billion US dollar pledged over 14 years ago must be fulfilled by COP28. The Green Climate Fund must be fully replenished. Adaptation finance must be doubled. And the fund for loss and damage must be fully operationalized at COP28. The objective here is not to open an empty bank account. This fund must be operationalized and the funding arrangements must be agreed. And on this very specific point, I am pleased that the extraordinary meeting that happened here in Abu Dhabi last weekend succeeded in sending clean, clear, and a direct set of recommendations that must be ratified at COP28. In addition, the broader framework of climate finance must be transformed. The IFIs and the MDBs, while I fully appreciate the fact that they recognize and acknowledge the need for a comprehensive holistic reform, it is my view that what is seriously needed is a surgical intervention to their mandate, to their charter, and to their code of conduct on how to make funds available, accessible, and affordable to the Global South. More concessional funding must be made available to help attract and incentivize private capital. We need smart policies to ensure the efficiency, integrity, and equity of voluntary carbon markets. And of course, we need innovative, new ways of providing blended finance to combine catalytic funding with private investment in order for us to be able to deploy large scale and large capital in helping the advancement of adoption of new zero carbon emission technologies. In short, the clean technologies that have been and continue to take off in the North must be made accessible and, av and available across the Global South. So it is not only making funds available, accessible, and affordable, but also what goes hand in hand with that is the fact that we help invest in capacity building and ensure the direct and easy and swift access to technology. A critical focus of COP28 is ensuring adaptation gets the focus it deserves. We must all agree that adaptation wasn't necessarily very high on the agenda of previous COPs. It is our job to bring adaptation central to the overall agenda. And that is, in fact, what I've been working on over the past few months. Currently, for every $10 spent on mitigation, only $1 goes to adaptation. And this, in my view, must change and must change now. And I am sincerely grateful for the leadership of the G20 and the T20 in highlighting the full spectrum 
of adaptation needs for the climate health nexus to nature to gender equity and adaptation response. COP28 will tackle these issues head on with a truly comprehensive and inclusive agenda. We will host the first ever climate health ministerial at a COP and we are lobbying all parties to sign COP28's declaration on climate and health. We are fostering a strong alliance between the world's three major rainforest regions to protect nature as it is our strongest ally. We do actually believe that nature is our strongest ally for climate resilience. And we are calling on all parties to sign the first ever leaders declaration on food systems, agriculture and climate. We want through COP28 to provide a meaningful, pragmatic, practical, results-oriented paradigm shift on how we address the climate challenge. We can no longer continue to go business as usual. And I'm sure some of you have noticed the subtle and smart disruption we're trying to introduce to the process. While we fully acknowledge and appreciate and respect the process, we're trying to introduce this smart transformation through our climate action agenda. And we're trying to integrate action through every step of the process, hoping that we embed a new way of thinking, because that is really what is needed. A completely new method, a new way, a new DNA in how we conduct the COPs. I fully appreciate <clears throat> that I'm today in a room with distinguished colleagues that help make or help develop policies through your own good work and through your think tanks. I do though see you as the ideas bank. And here I am calling on all of you to step up and to up, their, up your game. Just like how I've been asking everyone to step up. Time has come for all of us to unite and to act in order for us to deliver what is desperately needed in our effort in addressing the global challenge. We will, of course, support fully the independence and the full autonomy of the process, and we will support the negotiated and ambitious negotiated, out negotiated outcome at COP28. But I want to remind you again of the important role you can play and should play. Your thought leadership is critical. In fact, it is essential. And time has come for you to, uh, to come to terms with this reality. COP28 will provide you the platform, will provide you the opportunity to engage, to discuss, and to share your thoughts and your ideas. We want to be very inclusive, but please come with a mindset that is centered around pragmatism. Be practical. We want to see optimism spread all over. We want to see hope. Enough of the polarization, enough of divide. What we need is unity and solidarity. If we're serious of turning this around, and I know we can and we should, nothing should stop us from making this happen. We're only 18 days out from COP28. And I want to double down on what I've been calling for. It is only through unity that we will be able to get through this. We must unite. We must be action-oriented. We must ensure when we address a problem, we define the problem and we develop solutions of how to address 
that problem. I've heard enough problems. I have not heard enough attempts for solutions. That is what I'm calling for. I need to see the solutions. COP28 has been and will continue to be underpinned by full inclusivity. Everything we do, we will be fully inclusive. And yes, while I have been hearing all the negativity about the fact that we are being inclusive and we are bringing everyone on board, well, guess what? That is the only way to do it. We've had 27 COPs spanning 30 years. While I appreciate the incremental progress made over the years, one must accept that it hasn't been enough and that we continue to be off track. And I am coming here today from a position of strength simply because I have access to the global stock take. We have been entrusted to conduct the first ever global stock take. And I am seeing <clears throat> a very clear, transparent definition of what went wrong. Paris was successful in uniting the world in one agreement. Yet, as someone questioned how executable, how implementable that agreement is, I guess the global stock take is clearly defining the answer to that question. Now, we don't want to hold anyone responsible or, or accountable. That was a great, and in fact, it was a phenomenal achievement. Now, how can we build on it? How can we build on the incremental progress of the previous COPs? How can we build on the outcomes of the G20 and the fact that India was able to unite the world in addressing pressing issues? All of these are very important platforms that one must consider in the lead up to COP28. We will make sure that we bring all stakeholders to the table. We will leave no one behind. You know I have been around the world for the past year. And yes, I only arrived two hours ago, and in five hours I'll be back on a plane. That is what is needed, I promise you. That is what is needed. We need the world, especially now, with what's happening, whether in the Middle East or elsewhere. One must accept that we need to do everything we can to help restore faith and trust in multilateralism. And that is the earliest and only opportunity we have, COP28. If we are not able to demonstrate that the world can unite in addressing such a global challenge that touches every soul and everything on this planet, then I'm not sure what we will be able to address through multilateralism. I repeat, it is our responsibility to ensure that we continue to work very hard to show that multilateralism can and should work. We have no other option. Otherwise, if we continue to go in silos, we will only see more polarization, and more divide, and I don't think anyone smart wants to see that happen. We really want to replace discord with solidarity. Again, because that is our belief. That is what have helped shape the UAE. That is what have helped deliver what the UAE is all about today. My country is only three years older than me. I am still very young. And I promise you, if it wasn't for the mindset and the DNA of our founding father and the leadership and the people of the UAE in mastering the art of partnership, the art of dialogue, the art of communication, the art of being open, the art of building bridges, we would not be who we are today. And it is the same mindset, and it is the same DNA 
that I'm trying to embed in the overall theme of, uh, of COP28. Please help me help the world make the progress it needs. I have been calling on everyone to provide the maximum help they can, because that is what is needed. Again, I thank you all for the opportunity given to me today, and I very much look forward to receiving you all at COP28. And as my colleague said, I'll be happy to take a couple of questions uh, if you want. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for that very inspiring talk. My name is Lara Satrakian. I'm a writer on global policy solutions. I also chair a think tank based in Yerevan, Armenia. I noticed with keen interest Mazdar's investments, both in massive clean energy projects in Armenia and massive clean energy projects in Azerbaijan. I think it's been a vitally important step forward for the whole South Caucasus. So with that, uh, I would love to hear your sense for what is Mazdar's vision as it invests in countries, in their clean energy capacity. Is there a certain philosophy, a certain partnership model for transformation? And my stepped up bigger idea is, is there something of that culture of consensus and transformation in the UAE that comes with that partnership? Could that in the future extend to sharing what the UAE has learned in managing water resources or other elements, which may not fall within your direct remit, but the, the UAE is out front in a lot of areas and is learning in a lot of areas. And that's a lot of material that could potentially be transformative for small countries in the South Caucasus and elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, I'll address water quickly. Water is our next big thing. And you will see at COP28, and in particular as part of our climate action agenda, you'll start seeing how we're emphasizing the importance of water and not only helping address climate change, but in ensuring overall sustainability and security. Uh, I'm not at liberty at this point to talk more, but I promise you water has become one of our top national priorities, and it is being guided by the vision of His Highness the President. Just like how he took the lead on uh, renewable energy and the diversification of our economy by adopting an energy mix approach. I do remember in the very early days of our fact-finding mission of establishing Mustar, the whole world didn't believe that a country of the size and the scale of the UAE would ever be able to progress in that path which is advancement of renewable energy and clean technologies. And I used to get questioned everywhere I go. Why would you, as a major oil-producing nation, proactively seek a key role in the renewable energy space? And my answer was always to be very short and simple. Because we can and we should. Why not? If we were only to capitalize on our deep energy expertise, the partnerships and the relationships we've been able to create all over the world over the past years and the financial resources we have access to, what other better investment can we do than extending our leadership in the global energy market by advancing clean energies while investing in capacity building, while investing in technology, and while ensuring a sustainable socio-economic development program? So to us, it was more of a, a new economic development program. And that was what was so unique about our economic diversification plans by adopting a new energy mix approach. When we started with Mustar, <clears throat> we faced many challenges. While we were able to develop policy, in-country policy, to help the adoption of renewable energy as part of our energy mix, we faced many challenges that those policies didn't exist elsewhere. And many couldn't necessarily afford. So it wasn't only that Mazda will come and deploy capital or, or technology. 
we had to actually work with many countries to develop the necessary regulatory framework and policies that will help the adoption of renewable energy as part of the energy mix. And of course, this wasn't an easy task. That was a heavy lift. And that's why today, Masdar is so differentiated from many others. The fact that we come with a full package, the whole value chain. We come with policy, regulatory framework, technology, engineering capability, project management capability, and what differentiates us the most is our ability to blend finance. Again, and this is what we've learned over the years, and you will see at COP28, us being very practical on how we want to fix climate finance. It won't only be a report that we submit or a pledge we make, no. Building on the experience of Mustar, of how we can make private capital available through equity investments, we coupled it with catalytic funding, either through development funds or concessional funding. And that's what have helped us be in more than 40 countries with 25,000 megawatts of operational assets on our balance sheet today, while others continue to struggle, we were able to do it. So we're building on that model of blended finance, and you will see at COP28 us scaling it up in a big multiple to show how the UAE can play an instrumental role Mm -hmm. and helping advance this agenda. We, we, will, we will, I can comfortably, we will embarrass all the skeptics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a hand there. So let me first come to uh, the lady in the middle of the room. I think Kira was a late hand. But let's go to her first. So thank you very much. I'm Ornella Chochin. I'm coming from Albania and I had the opportunity for serving in two mandates in the Green Climate Fund as a board member representing the Eastern European countries and the Central Asian countries. Um, if I may, I have two questions for you. Three. Uh, can, can, we, can, one, we, can we have yes, two? Yes, I will be very fast. So you uh, represent everyone here then? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. You, go, you all uh, accept that we only take her questions <laughs> on your behalf. I will be very quick. Uh, the first one, it's um, Albania, the country that I'm, com that I'm coming from. It's the most attacked country from climate change in all Europe in the last 20 years. And we are producing 0% uh, carbon emission from the energy because we are 100% renewable energy production country. So um, my interest is how COP28 or 29, in this practical sense that you shared with us, we engage or uh, we oblige the countries, the governments, to invest on adaptation, except on their, um, on their uh, commitments that they have done on the COPs. Because in my country, we have only 0.8% of our annual budget going for the environment. Uh, the second one, the second question is, um, how you will help the developing countries, the small developing countries, accelerate accessing these funds because these funds are coming from the accredited agencies and the accredited agencies um, they are not very interested in small countries so how we will access in all the countries that i presented for two mandates we had only 0%, 0 percent 0 0.8 0 0.4 sorry percent of the budget of the green climate fund in 13 years and the last one uh, it's how you are uh, seeing your country in the next 10 years at the COP or the GCF as developing or developed countries. Thank you. Okay. First, uh, in regards to uh, your first question. Of course, as COP presidency, we will ensure we provide the space and the environment through the process. And we're coupling that with a very progressive, ambitious, comprehensive climate action agenda. We, we are not in a position to go uh, and pick on specific countries and interfere with their own internal affairs. That is not our job. And I'm sure you appreciate that. Having said that, like we've done in the past, through our bilateral relationships, we go, we engage, we identify opportunities, and we work with them on 
ensuring that we develop jointly the necessary regulatory frameworks that will support attracting our investments and others. On adaptation, like I said, the replenishment of the GCF is a critical success factor. Doubling adaptation finance is a critical success factor. Now, it all depends, though, on the recipient countries that can benefit by developing the necessary policies that is compatible with the criteria and the requirements of the GCF and, and other uh, instruments that exist today to help adaptation. So your second, uh, your second question, in fact, sits in the heart, not only of my COP presidency agenda, in the heart of the priorities of our leadership, SIDS and LDCs. Like we've done in the past, we've developed a number of initiatives that help, that support the SIDS and the LDCs. At COP28, you will see many practical means of implementation pro proposed by the UAE to support the SIDS and the LDCs. And we are very hopeful that others will follow. Because again, us on our own can't do everything. Mm. This is a global problem and it requires a global solution. We're trying to lead by example. And we will be demonstrating that through a number of initiatives that will be either scaled up, that exist and scaled up, or new initiatives that will be clearly communicated at, uh, at COP28. There was a decadal plan, 10 years. COP28 and 10 years from now, where we be? Great. Again, we have a mandate to conduct the first global stock take. It's been seven years since Paris. And we only have seven years to 2030. In 2030, I want the world to recognize the effort of the UAE. Not in 10 years, seven years. Why? Because we're helping define a robust, practical roadmap. What we are providing is not hypothetical, nor it is... Uh, I respect academia very much, <laughs> but it's not only academic, okay? It is business-oriented. It is action-oriented. We respect the science. Without the science, we, we wouldn't be where we are right now. We respect the science. It is the IPCC report that I used as my guiding principle in developing our strategy. In fact, if you go through my, our strategy at COP28, it is very much guided by the science. So no one can ever point fingers. It is the science, the science that have dictated our strategy. What we did though, we added the practicality element, the solution-driven mindset, a DNA that we know we can bring to the table in helping advance this. So in seven years, in order for us to keep 1.5 within reach, I'm going to be very clear with you. And I am sure you haven't heard this from previous COP presidencies. It is simple, 22 gigatons that we must reduce. That is our target. Mm. So stop all this nonsense of pointing fingers. It is 22 gigatons that we need to fight. It is 22 gigatons of CO2 that we must eliminate. We don't have time for this back and forth. We need to garner and unite all efforts in the fight of the 22 gigatons. So why are we fighting each other? Let's fight the 22 gigatons that we need to eliminate. That is what we need to stay focused on. That is 43% of the current emissions. Not an easy task. That is a heavy lift. And that would require a completely new way of thinking. And that is what we're trying to instill as part of COP28. I thank you again for the opportunity. Again, I would have liked to stay more, but unfortunately I have a very busy schedule and I do have a flight to catch. Thank you. Thank you very much.